Well, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for our part of our long-term care webinar series here at Baker Donaldson. My name is Tom Barnard. I'm a shareholder here in Baltimore, and I'm happy to talk to you today about a topic that uh, is a regular part of our lives here in the legal community in the healthcare world, the False Claims Act. Now today, I'm sure a lot of you um, are familiar with this, so this is gonna be a very introductory type presentation, but hopefully it'll spur some thoughts and we've added some, some details uh, to keep it interesting. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. There is a Q and A box. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in there and I'll try to get to them and address them as we go. Uh, and if you have, at the end, of course, I'll have my contact information. If there's anything you want to follow up uh, further, you feel free to email me and we'll go over that at the end as well. So a general overview of the False Claims Act, let's start there. So the False Claims Act is a federal statute and that, that's important to understand because a lot of this, you know, is governed under federal law and there's federal law enforcement authorities with, with some exceptions. The jurisdiction is exclusively in federal court, it's U.S. District Court, for, for re resolution. Um, the federal rules of civil procedure are what govern the proceedings. A state court claim may be included because there are state false claims act statutes that model themselves on the federal law. And federal law enforcement will be involved. And a lot of the folks that you will deal with in the federal law enforcement could be from HHS, OIG, it could be Defense, uh, Criminal Investigative Service, even the FBI, uh, will have both, you know, cr they will be criminal and civil enforcement agents. So it will be a very serious thing. The state authorities may have state investigators as well as part of their Medicaid fraud control units. A little bit of the understanding the False Claims Act, you have to go back to why it was started. And it, uh, you, you hear these history bits a lot, but it really helps you understand what the concern is. The back in the Civil War, substantial amount of fraud perpetrated by companies selling supplies to the army. Um, you know, where they would buy, a, you know, the old joke is, I ordered horses and you sent me mules. That, that was kind of the typical type of thing, um, you know, that, that was the concern. So there was a lot of financial risk to the government. And so it really stemmed from this federal procurement type concerns. Quickly though, um, you know, these were, it was regularly updated and revolved on numerous occasions. And what what's most unique about it is it allowed private citizens to sue on the government's behalf against people. In other words, it, it encouraged people who knew of crimes or knew of false activity to report it. So why is it called Quitam? Quitam is uh, one of those Latin phrases that we sometimes get in our legal profession that comes from the Middle Ages in England, when the king did not have its own police to enforce the law. They relied on private citizens, private prosecutors, kind of like if you think of a bounty system uh, that we had at times in our past here in the U.S. and still do. I will not try to read the Latin phrase, but it basically means who brings an action for the king as well as for himself. Now, one of the great questions I'm always asked is, how is Quitam supposed to be pronounced? The answer is, <laughs> nobody really knows. Everyone says it differently. Some say Quitam, 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 are the three that I often hear the most. There's no, in my mind, uh, there's no wrong way to do it as long as you can communicate what you're talking about. So the people who file the lawsuits are known as relators. So it's a slightly different term it's the same thing in many ways as the plaintiff, but relators has that extra meaning of it, the claim doesn't totally belong to them. It's being brought on behalf of someone else. The claim belongs to the king, or in this instance, the sovereign or the United States, because it's talking about the misuse of federal money. And the relator receives a bounty, or as we call it, the relator share, their portion of any proceeds that are required. So this is what motivates, you know, a lot of times relators. They're motivated for a lot of reasons sometimes, and we'll talk about, you know, things that go wrong in employment or feeling uh, unlistened to, but this is, you know, a big part of it. And certainly what draws lawyers to help uh, relators known as relators counsel. So what are the basic elements of a False Claims Act? The elements of a False Claims Act, um, they've got to show that there's a false claim 
something has to be false. And we'll talk about what are the types of things that could be false. They've got to be made with the requisite scienter, and that's called you know the mens rea or state of mind. And it's what's called knowingly. And we'll talk about that definition. The, the false claim must be material to the payment. In other words, what you said that was false must be material to the government's decision to pay. And the false claim you know, has to have caused the government to actually pay money. Like when you submitted it, the government uh, would pay money. In the statute that goes over seven, seven different types of conduct that can constitute a false claim. And we'll, we're gonna go over a few of those that are the most common. The most common ones are the standard, you know, liability for presenting or causing to be presented a false or fraudulent claim. In other words, I have a claim for $100, but I know the claim is only supposed to be $50. If I actually present it, present it is often a, a, a term that is legally uh, debated sometimes in some of these cases because it means actually giving it to an agency. So if you just create it and put it in a drawer, you could often say, I was never presented, therefore not actually submitted. Um, or causing to be presented. Now, this is a very important phrase that is the more typical one because most healthcare providers use billing companies. They don't actually personally bill them. So this is a, or they'll use some other agency to do the billing. So that, that's why causing to be presented is a big part of this. Um, and, um, and then it, for, it is for the purposes of getting payment. Now, payment, what constitutes a payment um, is subject to some discussion as well, because sometimes it could just be relieving an obligation. Okay. The false statement provision, this is for not only making a false record of a statement material to the false claim. So, for instance, we all understand how we bill for healthcare services. Well, what if we didn't falsify, you know, the bill itself but we falsified the records that formed the basis to support the bill, causing someone else to submit the false claim. That can also be a false statement. This is one that's the co very common, it's called the reverse false claim. The reverse false claim is that improper conduct to avoid paying the government or improper retention of an overpayment. You can imagine circumstances where this comes up in the healthcare context quite a bit. So for instance, um, let's say, um, you know, the government improperly pays the, the uh, incorrect per diem rate uh, or incorrect rate for a particular care. And you just kind of, and someone, they didn't do anything to cause that. But once they learn that the government has done it, if they decide to keep it, not tell the government, that then can trigger what's called a reverse false claim. The other more common one that we'll talk about is where, um, you know, we make mistakes in billing all the time. It, it just happens. And that simply making a mistake is not a false claims act. But let's say you're in a, in a, a healthcare setting and you discover that, hey, we've been improperly billing something for you know using this code instead of this code. And it turns out it resulted in a lot more money for your practice. You haven't done anything wrong yet. You simply have to repay it. But if you then decide, you know what, we're not gonna repay it. As soon as you learn of the overage and don't correct it, you may trigger False Claims Act risk. Conspiracy, it also has conspiracy provisions. Here we're talking about where um, you know, companies work together. You see this quite a bit in some of the scheme type provisions where you know, a uh, provider is working with a, uh, a specialty clinic or for referrals and uh, kickbacks or something. You'll see a lot of conspiracy type uh, allegations. Let's see. Um, so we talked a little about the knowing standard. So what does it mean to be knowing? Well, this is often where most debates on the False Claims Act come down. Like I talked about before, simply making a mistake isn't enough. You have to know what you submitted was false. Well, there's three ways you can know something was false. The first one is you actually know it's false. I'm submitting this, I know it's false, I'm submitting it anyway. That's pretty simple for all of us to understand. Deliberate ignorance, ignorance of the truth or falsity of the information is another way. How would that work? That would be, look, I'm the billing company or I'm this company. I don't want to know. Just submit it. I, I'm not going to ask any questions. You know, I'm just 
you know, trying to avoid any kind of knowledge of what's the behind the, you know, that's often, um, you know, what I call the ostrich gene or put your head in the sand. The most common one though is the reckless disregard. And this is why this is the most common. Most of us are gonna try to say, look, we made a mistake, we'll pay it back, we'll fix it. Well, the government sometimes believes that, but sometimes says, well, was the mistake predictable or was it truly a mistake? By predictable means you were running a, a practice that didn't pay any attention to the rules. You know, you have, uh, so, so for instance, let's say you have a billing specialist reviewing the records through the billing who's never been trained basically just reading the book, picking codes at random without any kind of instruction, You're, you, you, you knew or should have known that false billing was likely to take place. Uh, th these are the kind of things where they say, or you set up a system where, um, oh, by default, all of the particular type of care always gets this bill with no independent judgment, that's kind of a, a reckless disregard for whether or not it's accurate. Important to understand is specific intent to fraud is not required. And this is often something we hear is that, look, I'm not, we're not bad people. We didn't, we didn't try to do this. Of course you didn't. But the government um, will take a close look to see whether or not you did, you gave adequate care to address it. So the last part of the falsehood, and this, this often comes up in the healthcare context, is what's called false certification. When in healthcare, we submit bills or invoices to the government. They often contain one of two types of certification, an implied certification or an express certification. Some invoices have stamps that say, you know, I certify this is, you know, that everything in this um, bill is in accordance with the applicable regulations, or they may have specific requirements, certify it, it's compliant with the anti-kickback statute or an express statement, or there's an implied certification on what's called a condition of payment in the CMS regulations or, or, or CMS manual or provider manual, where it says, I, you know, I'm certifying that I'm complying with all material regulations. It's kind of an implied certification that's deemed to be when you submit the bill, you are impliedly certified. This is one of the ways that the anti-kick um, kickback statute um, is often interpreted because it's generally assumed that if you submit bills, you're certifying that your financial relationships related to that bill are in accordance with the law and applicable regulation. So as far as I see a question here about the threshold for knowing, knowing is uh, you don't, um, okay, so good. The, the, uh, so Knowing is often the debate. I mean, as is in criminal cases and in false claims act cases, the mens rea or the knowledge of the party submitting the bill is always the debate. So in the beginning, and this really clues you in as to why whistleblowers are so important, the government has access to all the, the data. They don't know as the state of mind, where this is an innocent mistake or was this intentional. That's where the whistleblowers really provide the insights. So they like, I was in meetings, I was on emails, I know that everyone knew we weren't supposed to do it, but did it anyway. That's the real, you know, that's what helps get the, the government over the final hurdle sometimes for establishing it knowing. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we talk about how these cases work. So really, this is the unique part is the process. And this is often one of the hardest things to you know, get a hold of because it's so much different than normal litigation. There is a, most of the effort that happens in most False Claims Act cases begins before we ever enter into a litigation phase. So what happens is there's a, it, it usually, if there's an actual quitam, and we'll talk about those as the primary vehicles right now, is the filing of a complaint by a relator. And what accompanies the complaint is a relator disclosure statement as well as the complaint. The complaint gets filed in court, the disclosure statement is served on the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office. That disclosure statement and complaint, you know, tip of, you know, show the knowledge and information that the relator has. And it's essentially like um, you're bringing it, the matter to the government, trying to get them to be interested, trying to sell them, essentially take up the case because it's in the relator's financial interest. 
the statute requires the government to investigate any time, at least doing enough sufficient investigation to make a decision on whether or not to take the case when this information, when a case is filed, the information is brought to them. This investigation, as we'll talk about, we're going to go into some detail, uh, is, is often the lengthy process. The government will then make a decision on whether or not to intervene or decline. We'll talk about what those mean. And often they'll be filing, if the government decides to intervene and pursue the case, they'll file their own complaint and serve uh, the complaint um, and begin, then we get into litigation. So let's talk about these details a little bit more. The filing of the complaint. It's under seal, and that's really hard thing for most people to understand is the way you as a provider will learn about one of these cases is you won't know a complaint's been filed. You're going to get a subpoena or a civil investigation demand, investigative demand, and be answering questions and providing documents to the government, and the government will not be able to tell you under court order that a complaint has been filed. Now, eventually they will reveal it, but it doesn't happen while the investigation is ongoing. The complaint and all that is, is sent to both the U.S. attorney where the complaint is filed in the district, as well as the attorney general, and it's, it's detailed to the civil frauds division at the Department of Justice, who will then make a decision on their level of involvement in a case. The government's required to investigate the allegations. The statute initially calls for 60 days. It's so, I, I can't think of many instances where 60 days has been sufficient unless there's something deficient or obvious about the, the, the problem. So they're usually then extended. They're usually extended in six months increments. And I think on average, these investigations could take two or three years uh, uh, in many instances. So why do they remain under seal? They remain under seal because the government's doing their investigation and to protect the relator, protect the information and limit the amount of public knowledge about what's going on until they've made a decision is in the government's interest. It protects sources, it protects uh, access to information, and helps ensure that in, uh, evidence doesn't disappear. Why do they take so long? Well, because some of these are very complicated. This isn't kind of a, you know, who's you know looking at a video and seeing what happened. It, these, are, these are often years and years in a practice. So they often look at six years of conduct as the typical window they look at. They're looking at sometimes hundreds and thousands of emails they're looking at claims, they're looking at medical records. Um, so it's often a very uh, long and, and, and complicated process. Now, the statute specifically authorizes some very unique tools to civil enforcement authorities called the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Division in most U.S. attorneys' offices. They have what are called document requests. Those would be your typical subpoena. They're like subpoenas, only they're under this different authority. They can also order depositions, and these are not like depositions that you think about in a normal lawsuit. These are depositions where basically you're being questioned by the government, and there's, you know, it's not like a normal where you're doing objections and all. It's a very different setting. They can ask for interrogatories. They, they, they look and sound like the normal discovery tools, but again, there's unique rules for how these take place. They're not just like normal civil discovery. At the end of the investigation, the government decides whether to what's called intervene or decline to intervene. What does that mean? Those are unique terms. Intervene, it means the government essentially steps in and pursues the case. So the relator brings the case originally kind of on behalf of the government, tries to convince the government to get interested. If the government decides to get interested, they'll step in and take over how the case is run. And the court cases, in fact, very recent court cases show that once the government makes that decision, they pretty much have exclusive control over the future of the case. Now, if the government declines the case, says, we're not interested at this time, the relator can continue to sue and continue with the litigation, even though the government's not participating. Now, the government is not really out simply because they declined, but they're taking what's called a back seat, allowing the relator to pursue it. The result still exits the government's money, so they still get it. But the relators share change. The relators get a little more for their effort and may pursue it a little more figure if the government wasn't super interested. 
when the government intervenes, if they intervene, they often draft their own focus complaint. Because if you can imagine, the relator's filed under seal complaint is often very broad with a lot of different allegations. The government may pick exactly which one of the various allegations it thinks has the best you know, uh, litigation value or likely that they have the most interest in. Now, this is, this is um, it may impact how much the relator recovers, or it may not, it depends on how different they look. Um, the relator at the end, of, if the government declines, can choose to amend their complaint and um, make a new one to a, you know, a narrow it. But then they, they then proceed on normal litigation where they serve the complaint of the defendant and the normal federal rules of procedure then kick in. Now, the relator may also elect to dismiss or settle the complaint directly with the defendant, but the government still technically is in charge and has to consent to either a dismissal or a settlement. After the service of the complaint, it's mostly like any other civil litigation. However, the defense is always going to file a motion to dismiss because there are very unique technical defenses. Some are jurisdictional. It, it alleges usually fraud, so there's going to be what's called the heightened Rule 9 of Federal Civil Procedure pleading standards. And there's a lot of case law on what has to be concluded in a valid claim. They differ, in fact, sometimes from circuit to circuit. So you'll see where a case is filed may govern some of the defenses that may be raised. After the motion, you, if, if any claims survive, you'll then go into normal discovery. Sometimes a relator is an ex-employee or a current employee who's suffered retaliation, often uh, because they raised issues of compliance and no one listened, or they fired them for raising ish complaints of compliance. This is often referred to as an H claim because it's the subpart H on the types of claims under the False Claims Act. This is the one exception to the rule. This claim actually belongs to the relator, not the United States. This is like a normal employment law uh, rights to bring a case. However, the standard for this kind of retaliation is different than the type of retaliation that you may be used to seeing in normal employment law context. Um, um, oh, I guess going back to that declination question, I see a question here. Is the government's interest, uh, you know, is it involved in substance or, you know, policy or monetary? The answer is often both. And we're going to talk about, I do have a slide here that talks about the types of things that a government considers in deciding whether to intervene or not. There is a number of large variety of factors of whether or not to decide to intervene. A lot of it is sometimes money, but money alone is not it. A lot of times it's patient safety, other things, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So the retaliation claims, as opposed to your normal employment law claims, the difference is what constitutes protected activity. Um, in, in a false claims act case, what co it's a very narrow definition to be protected activity. And so uh, it's almost always a problem uh, that will be raised. But these are often settled uh, as part of the false claims act settlements. So how do these settle? Most cases end, the vast majority by either the, the government completing their whole investigation and saying, you know what, there's no merit or not interested in this case, we're gonna decline. And then the relator will often then voluntarily dismiss the case because the government has declined rather than proceed on their own. Usually it's because we find that there, you know, to some people, what looks like a violation when you get into the rules isn't necessarily a violation. Cases that do have merit often settle because the risks of litigation and the consequences of being found liable under the act are so large that it's often, a, from a financial perspective, much more advantageous to settle um, than risk trial and judgment. If they don't settle or get dismissed, then you might either, as we talked about, have litigation by the government or litigation by the relator. And then you go through all the litigation, the motions, the discovery, and then maybe you go back and they may settle again. Occasionally there are trials, but the trials are very complicated, they're very long, and um, they're very expensive. And a risk of a trial here um, it will, you know, put some substantial additional penalties uh, that a jury, you know, could award if it were to go to trial. 
So when do you engage this negotiation? A lot of times the timing can vary. You may get, you know, the way some of these times work is you may be looking at a problem internally, doing an internal review, and get a subpoena from the government about the very same issue because they hear it from a whistleblower. At which time you then have a discussion with the government and you say, look, we're already looking at this. We're going to look to repay it, resolve it, and you, know, and you work something out. The objectives of the various parties um, will often govern the negotiation. If it's simply look like it's a very singular problem, we're just going to get it fixed, it may happen quickly. If it's a little more complicated, if there's patient safety, if it, you know, let's say you're in a facility that someone in the agency says, well, we need to shut this facility down. Then you have other issues that may come up. The key negotiating issues that are often resolved are, you know, what is the, obviously the money amount, but the scope of the release, what conduct is included that is going to be released by the government? Then there's going to be the administrative remedies. Um, the Department of Justice does not decide what the Office of Inspector General will do, neither does the Office of Inspector General decide what the Department of Justice will do. So these are often two separate discussions. By administrative remedy, typically what we're talking about here is whether or not the OIG will require a corporate integrity agreement, which you know is a, a type of thing that you know the DOJ settles what's happened, the OIG then resolves to make sure it never happens again through a kind of third party third party monitoring of conduct. You'll there'll be a discussion of relator share. That negotiation is between the relator and the government, not the defendant. Then there'll be a discussion of attorney's fees. That settlement is between the relator and the defendant, not the government. The False Claims Act allows the relator to recover for their attorney's fees. In addition to the relator's counsel being able to get a um, contingent portion of any recovery. So that's one of those neat statutes where a lawyer can essentially uh, have a, a little bit of a windfall at the outcome. The DOJ, DOJ priorities are usually uh, Making the government whole, uh, what they want to do is get all the government's money back. They want to deter future fraud or other misconduct. And they're going to consider um, any an amount of defendants' cooperation. It's in the government's interest that defendants cooperate in these investigations as so they try to make it worth the defendants' uh, effort to cooperate. So how does that work? Well... If a company discovers conduct that might give rise to F false claims of liability, it should consider self-disclosure. There is a self-disclosure protocol uh, with, with HHS OIG, uh, and you know, there's lawyers who that's what they focus on is doing these voluntary disclosures. It helps protect you from higher multipliers, uh, higher uh, penalties. Um, it helps guarantee that you won't be, you know, avoiding things like exclusions, help you with the, the corporate integrity agreement negotiations. These are all things that would be very beneficial to doing a self-disclosure. Now, key here, you can't, you can't do a self-disclosure after you found out you're under investigation. It has to be done before you're under investigation, otherwise it's not really considered a voluntary self-disclosure. Now, that instead, if you find out you're under investigation, you may be more in the blind of what's called cooperation. Now, cooperation credit has historically been something that was in the um, uh, sentencing guidelines that dealt with um, uh, criminal matters. But the False Claims Act um, also allows for the reducing the, of damages for a person who cooperates. That's usually, they do it in terms of the multiplier. And so we're going to talk about how these cases get resolved. The False Claims Act allows the government to require, recover up to three times the amount of the false claim. So, you know, up to three times the amount means they can do an incentive to make that number lower and lower. Sometimes it may be that they take singles if it's part of a voluntary disclosure. Other times it may be doubles in the settlement or maybe something less than doubles. A company is considering self-disclosure that are significant time restraints, though. It's very difficult to get through it implement corrective action, terminate, and disclose it to the appropriate U.S. Attorney's Office. So doing that in a quick manner, getting that kind of credit, um, it, it has a lot, it, you know, a lot of benefits. And more importantly, if you do the self-disclosure and get it resolved, 
if someone then does file a quitam, the government will have already investigated it and could curtail um, the disclosure by making, you know, um, the, it's a matter already under government investigation or possibly even has voluntarily or has publicly disclosed the settlement. So what are the damages the government can require, recover? If you're found liable at trial, the cost of bringing civil action to recover, you can be liable for. A civil penalty in the amount between 11,000, 23,000, this is adjusted from time to time for each claim. So if there's a million claims, um, uh, oh, good question about the cooperation credit. You know, there are some informal kind of, uh, you know, is there a guidance specific guidance? It's not like the sentencing model where sentencing manual in criminal cases where there's like points that get reduced. This is very much a case by case, office by office, and it requires a little bit of research to find out what has been done. It's not been a purely objective analysis that I have experienced, though I think with a voluntary disclosure, there are some clear objective with HHS before anything with DOJ. Uh, this, this cooperation credits a little bit more of a negotiation because what constitutes complete cooperation has been up to some debate as far as, you know, disclosing the identity of key individuals and other things. So that's often something that is negotiated as part of the settlement. But obviously, the more cooperative, the better. The key is that you're not going to get cooperation credit if you try to hide information. That's the, the bottom line. And no government's going to give you that. Um, so back to the damages just briefly up to three times the amount of the, the singles plus per claim. So if you have 100,000 claims, you're gonna be paying potentially penalties before you even get to the actual damages and, and multiplier. How to calculate singles is always in dispute. Why is it always in dispute? Because let's say, um, you let, just give an example. Let's say you're filing a claim for a medical procedure and you use a modifier on it. And the, uh, the judgment is, well, the modifier was improperly used. Is the false claim the entire submission, the care plus the modifier, or just the modifier? There's some debate as to whether or not if any part of a claim is false, the entire claim is false. So there will always be some dispute about that. In a settlement, the usual range is somewhere between two and three. Usually, if it's a cooperative settlement where you get right to it without litigation, you should be closer to two based on the conduct and things, but it's it could be higher. I mean, the, it all depends on the level of corporate conduct that's in question. The bottom line is if you want to get a release, which means the actual settlement agreement where the government releases you from false claims act liability for particular covered conduct, you're going to have to pay a multiplier. Otherwise, you're simply just doing a repayment and you won't get a release. And I think that's something that's hard but it has to be understood up front. Now, there is some dis d dispute um, about how the, you calculate it. There's the gross multiplier rule and the net multiplier rule. So the best example I can give for this is, let's say you had, um, let's say you detect that you had a million dollars in overpayments. So you pay a million back. Some people in the government, you know, one theory in the gross multiplier rule is going to say, well, you know, it's your total damages is up to three million because three times the amount of false claim. You gave a million back, you still owe two. The net multiplier is we don't apply the multiplier until we determine the difference of what you've paid back. Um, so there's some dispute as to that. But again, in a settlement context, it tends to be more. Um, uh, it tends to be more of a negotiation than anything. These damages, and, and, we'll, and I think we talk a little bit about some of the, um, how you get there, some of the unique things, it's, it's, it's hard to figure it out. So let's say you have, let's say you're a, a long-term care chain with, you know, number of facilities, uh, lots of patients over six years. You're not going to, it's going to be very, very difficult to go back and look at every patient care and everything 
Um, so there's a lot of sampling that's done. And we're going to, we'll talk a little about sampling and the debate about that, but you try to estimate and come up with percentages. So a lot of times um, these negotiations come down to things like, well, the total amount of Medicare billed in the current year was a million dollars. We think that based on our evidence of the sample, roughly 20% of your care was improper or false. So therefore, we'll apply that 20% across your total claims. That may be the government's starting position. The defense may say, you know what, we think your percentage is too high. We also think using total claims is too high because everyone we did wrong was only in this type of patient. So you shouldn't include claims for these other types of patients. So there's a lot of parts that you want to piece out to try to get the number to what closely fits what happened without having to literally review every single patient for every single claim. I, I think as, as you go through these, the cost of doing those review becomes so um, extensive. Uh, yeah, so I, talking about copies of the slides, I took a couple questions about that. Yes, we can work, we can reach out to me after the after the presentation if you wanna get copies of the slides and we can, we can try to work, uh, get these distributed. Um, Okay, so let's talk, move on from that. What kind of award can the relator recover? As I mentioned, this is the way, what motivates relators in a lot of ways. And we'll talk about a little bit more what motivates them as we talk about tips on how to avoid these. If, a, if an FCA case is successful, i.e. it settles and there's a large recovery, the relator stands to collect a percentage of any judgment of settlement, regardless of whether or not the government intervenes. If the government does not intervene and there's a judgment, the relator can get between 25 and 30%. If the government intervenes, the relator can get up to 25%. Um, and there'll be, there's, a, there's kind of a, a factor list that government and, uh, attorneys go through with the relator's counsel as to, well, you know, this is a plus up, this is a plus down. There's a, a series of factors that go through, but a lot of it is based on how much the Relators Council contributed to the effort and how much did the information provided by the Relator motivate or decide the ultimate resolution. Additionally, the Relator then can get their um, expenses and fees reimbursed through separate settlement, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, any retaliation or employment related claim. So what else might motivate a relator? And we'll, we'll let's talk on this just for a, a few seconds. Um, you know, when you, <laughs> employees that have a bad experience at, a, at a, a location, employees that are terminated, employees that are feel disrespected, or if you have a climate where employees don't feel they can report or discuss concerns they have without fear of judgment or retaliation, that's kind of the environment or atmosphere that lends itself towards the correlation of a relator. Um, you know, if you have a, if you get notified of a false claims at case, first question I often ask someone is, well, who, who have you fired or who has left in the recent months or recent years? And was there a, a complaint? Did they, did they raise issues that were ignored? Um, sometimes it's about communication. I have seen some where the relator is someone who raised complaints it was thoroughly investigated by the entity, but no one ever went back to the relator to let them know, hey, we heard your complaint. This is what we did to look into them. We found out uh, that it, it was not, there was nothing there. So in other words, the, the relator never found out that, so they, they believed that they'd been ignored by their employer, even though they hadn't been. So sometimes it's just a communication issue that may drive a relator. So there, there's a number of things. There are of course copycat relators where if you have a similar industry to someone who just had a big settlement, someone may copy that. Um, so there are a number of things. So what are some of these legal issues that are very unique to the False Claims Act? Well, there's some very unique defenses. This was called a criminal conduct bar. If a relator is convicted of criminal conduct arising for the role, if they were the person in the fault, you know, if they're the one paying bribes and they get convicted for paying bribes, they can't file a false claims act and recover money um, against the company who they happen to be working for when paying the bribes. Second, the first to file bar. 
You know, if, and this is, you know, especially with larger companies, not an uncommon thing where someone files a lawsuit in one jurisdiction, someone files a lawsuit in another jurisdiction a couple of months later, where they allege essentially the same conduct. That, you know, the test is often, if the first claim reasonably put the government on notice sufficient to investigate the same allegations that are brought up in the second complaint, then it's usually going to be considered barred under the first to file bar. If the government's already a party to a civil administrative money proceeding concerning the same conduct, that's, you know, they, that's, people can't just watch the court of claims docket and file lawsuits. Um, and then there's the public disclosure bar, where um, a QTAM is based on information that has been disclosed to the public through several means. This may be in a newspaper or public filing or complaints. There's some exceptions where the, if the same person who filed it is the original source, but generally speaking, um, this is meant to present people from just trolling reports in newspapers and filing lawsuits based on newspaper stories. So what are some of the factors the government may consider in deciding what to pursue? Obviously, what's the strength of the evidence of the various elements? I mean, that as a government lawyer, always you're thinking about, can I prove this case in court? So you're trying to say, how strong is the evidence? How direct is the evidence? What's the number? And you guys can probably guess what's the number one way we prove knowing? Well, I hate to say it, it's emails and it's poor business hygiene in, in, in emails. Okay. Uh, I think that's been a, a, a thing over time. Obviously, witness testimony is one, is one another way, but emails is often um, where this is uh, centered. Evidence and arguments regarding materiality. What are we talking about there? Well, if it's, you know, let's just say there's a regulation that every room in a nursing room, in a nursing home, had to have three towels in it, and we only had two towels. Well, is the government going to, you know, there's a good argument to say, is the number of towels present in the room really uh, material to the question whether they pay for the care? You know, th those are the kind of things. Is what, it, what are some of the things? You know, what is the evidence that the particular regulation in question was material to the question of payment? Can we show that there's causation? What are the damages? If I can show that a, a, a provider violated all these regulations, but it never resulted in any loss to the government, is that a case that may, when I might be interested in the government and for trial, may it be one that I say this is better handled at an agency enforcement uh, level? and I'll coordinate with the agency. What are the strengths of the defenses? What kind of resources? Yeah, there might be a case here, but we'd probably have to have six agents, you know, three forensic consultants It would take years. Maybe a, a quick, quicker settlement makes more sense. What are some factors, oh, some more factors? Policy statements, industry guidance. You know, there may be a, a outdated CMS regulation that says something, but the practice of medicine and the, you know, uh, advent of technology has made it obsolete. Maybe it's in our interest if sometimes the you know talking to the FDA that yes, at the technically at the time the drug wasn't approved for that use, but it subsequently was. So is it really a good case to bring a fraud case? Um, and then negotiate you know discussions with other factors. And then lastly, responsibility of individuals. Was it really a corporate action, or was there a single individual actor that we? it makes more sense to pursue. What about cases where there's no quitam? How come I've gotten cases where at the end of the day, there's no quitam? Well, I, this is my opinion. This is not, I'm not attributing this to anyone, not to the government. I just believe that the government likes to bring what I call homegrown cases or investigations where there's no relator. Well, what are one of the big reasons? Well, that's 20 to 25% of the recovery that the government keeps rather than going to a third party. Um, they get to control the investigation. It's not under a court deadline or under a seal complaint. And it allows the increased use of data analytics. This is one thing I really want to highlight is more and more cases are coming from this because it makes more sense. If I am in the government and I can see patterns of irregularity with the conduct of a care provider, I'm going to ask questions. 
it's it's only natural if someone's spending my money in a weird way i'm gonna ask why right um so what would be a weird way it would be like why is it that you know there's i'm looking at say uh, here i am in uh, let's just pick uh, uh maryland is where i'm at let's say i'm looking at, at all the data in maryland for every pharmacy and on average pharmacies of a particular size pers- you know fill prescriptions for this drug between this often or this this percentage of their total drug fills but there's one where that's the only drug they filled every day you know for for the last year they're at the the, the top percentile 100th percentile of other pharmacies of their size in the state well that's very unusual why is that then i look at other data that says well who are the prescriptions signed by that they're filling well they're all signed by the same doctor well that's very unusual so now i start to question are they enforcing the re- re- prescription requirements are these drugs medically necessary is there an improper relationship between that pharmacy and this provider a kickback type relationship so those naturally tend itself to do inquiry and that's exactly what this uh this statute is meant to do and what's great is under the false claims act they can do cids and subpoenas to look into it before ever filing a case so therefore, you're not really charged with anything. They're simply doing an investigation. Well, how, here's another question that comes up. Why are some handled by Maine Justice, quote, Maine Justice, the Justice Civil Frauds Division, and others by an AUSA? Well, if a QUITAM is filed, it has to be served on the Department of Justice, Civil Frauds, the Attorney General, as well as the U.S. Attorney. The Department of Justice, the main, what I call Maine Justice, decides if they are interested in being involved in the case. They can designate to handle it exclusively themselves. They can handle it jointly with the U.S. Attorney's Office. They can mo- be in a role where they're simply monitoring it. They can completely delegate it. There's a lot of factors that go into that decision, some of which are the, the value of the stake and things like that. The other one is if it's a case that's developed locally through the use of analytics or otherwise, it won't really involve main justice until the time they decide to file a complaint. So that's why sometimes you'll see only an AUSA. And it doesn't really mean anything about the strength or merits of a case. It's more of an administrative history of how it came about to be. Well, how about ongoing criminal investigations? Could I, how do I know if I don't have a risk? Well, there's always a risk, but typically you know, cooperation and coordination is favored under the Department of Justice guidance. And that includes sharing evidence to the fullest extent appropriate to the case and permissible by law. However, there's clear, in, when you're dealing with the federal government, it's clearly not going to be the case where, you know, civils doing the investigation as a stalking horse or something for the criminal or, or vice versa. But they'll be honest, they're, they're going to be sharing information. And, and the typical arrangement is going to be where civil is leading it and then criminal is monitoring it. And if they find evidence that would support a criminal case, they're going to bring it to the criminal AUSA's attention. If they know from the outset it's criminal, criminal is going to probably take the lead. Why is that? Well, because there's one particular tool that civil doesn't have access to that only criminal does, and criminal can't really share the evidence from that tool with civil. That's the grand jury. Uh, the, 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 the disclosure requirements of the grand jury do not permit uh, civil AUSAs the same type of access. Sometimes. You also may see where matters are stayed while the mat- one matter is pending. So last little bit of this, I want to talk about some specific issues I see in long-term care. And I generally group investigations in long-term care under the False Claims Act into four major factors that are considered. The first one is the government believes, and it's the case from a business perspective, you want to maximize your census. No one wants to have a nursing home with 200 beds, but only fill 100 of them, because that's that's capacity that's being lost. You want to fill your home to the extent you can provide it in a compliant, safe, and effective way. Now, no one wants, but again, no nurse wants to fill a nursing home with every bed if they don't have enough nurses to care for the patients. So there's a balance that has to make make that judgment. So when maximizing sentence censuses, you're going to look at well, who's making the admissions decisions? Where do most of the admissions come from? In other words, the admissions decisions, is this purely a, a money person or someone from the, the medical community making sure these people are qualified and you have the capacity to care for them? Where do the admissions come from? 
They're looking at, is, do I have a relationship with particular hospitals where there's any kind of kickback? Do you have people who are routinely admitted, discharged, readmitted? What, why is that? Why are there what's called patient churning? What are the averages over time for the lengths of stays? And what are the factors that drive census at the facility? Is it public, dis, you, know, you know, when you look at the ratings, uh, things like that. The next factor, minimizing costs. This is really, you know, an area that's extreme focus because it relates in many ways to the quality of care. Who is managing the staff? And I know we've recently, there is an article I recently pushed out with some folks here about new proposed regulations on staffing. Uh, this is going to have a big role here because the more objective the staffing requirements are, the more there's chances for direct enforcement. When we talk about minimizing costs, it almost always comes down to staffing. Who manages it? You know, this is why I talked about bad emails, is emails here by business people who naturally are trying to cut costs because there's nothing illegal about trying to cut costs, but is it, are they careful to always make sure it's done in a safe way, it's done in a medically compliant way? What's the use of ratio of overtime and agency? In other words, if, if I'm depending entirely on overtime and agency, it usually means I'm understaffing or under, you know, having trouble hiring? Who's monitoring? Do you have a place where someone's ensuring that the care has been adequate or you're just kind of hoping it's adequate? Uh, how are the functions divided? Who's doing what? Do you have a lot of instances where there's pressure on CNAs to do nurse functions reserved to nurses because you don't have enough nurses on staff? These are things the government may ask. Maximizing reimbursements. What are we doing to maximize our reimbursements? Who's preparing the cost reports? Who's managing the billing activity? Are the billers on property? How accurate is the information that's being used? What's the relationship? Are you periodically auditing them? You know, what other ways are you maximizing the reimbursement? Are you categorizing the all the, the patients into certain categories? A lot of these um, uh, baseline assessments, are they being overinflated? That that's, that's has been historically one of the questions that's been asked. And then the ownership of the management structure. This is an increasing focus in the government. Is the people who own it and manage it the same people running it? Are the owners and managers taking management fees? Are they doing anything? How are they paid? Who controls the bank accounts, the local people or someone else? These are questions that the government's going to focus on is to see how the money is spent. Um, another one it's in here is the relationships we have in a, say in a long-term care, specialty care providers like wound care, um, therapy care, specialized therapy. What's the relationship between the homes and those providers? Uh, what's the level of part B type billing that's going on in addition to the per diem? Is there any financial exclusivity agreements? How, uh, is there any money coming back to the facility in exchange for the access? These are often carefully scrutinized. And when I was talking about those data analytics, when you see substantial more wound care at this particular type of facility than other similar types of facilities, that's the kind of thing that um, the government may take a closer look at. So what are the most common legal theories that I see in the False Claims Act when it comes to long-term care? Typically, it's in the certification and implied certification regarding compliance with individualized plan of care, uh, therapy being provided, group therapy, um, uh, staffing ratios, and adequate staffing. Um, but the most common theory we're seeing, I've seen in long-term care is the worthless services theory. In other words, that the care is so bad that it essentially renders the care to be of no value whatsoever and thereby uh, reimburse it, not not properly paid by the government. This is a difficult thing to prove, but it's broad enough that allows the government a very wide range of issues to look at for their investigation. So what are the, some other common hot topics that come up? Obviously, the materiality, the pleading standards, sampling I talked about, and what is an adequate legal sample to proceed with litigation. There's new legal challenges to the causation of the anti-kickback statute as to whether or not um, even an improper relationship, does you have to show that it actually affected the doctor's opinions, or is it presumed to have affected 
the provider's opinions. There's going to be continued debate about that based on the most recent changes to the language in the False Claims Act. More COVID-related issues here, especially involving the PPP loans and um, what those monies were used for. Uh, in the healthcare generally, um, the increased use of private equity, uh, the, the litigation is coming down to, at the time of the purchase, what was known or should have been discovered during the due diligence? And did the new owners take action to correct any deficiencies they identified? Otherwise, they can essentially inherit a major problem. Voluntary disclosures continues to be encouraged and uh, a, a topic that you know always is raised as people review their material and find information. With that, I we got about four minutes left. I wanted to open it up if there's any questions that anyone would like me to address with, some, uh, with the time remaining. Well, my information is on here. Feel free to reach out to me if you have maybe a more specific question. Oh, here we go. Here's a good question. This may be discussed, but on the first to file concept. Well, it's an interesting, a good question. A uh, question about whether or not the first to file, if a relator has filed a claim which has adequately put the government on notice, can an organization continue with a self disclosure? Um, it's a good question because the, the real test on self-disclosure is whether or not you have knowledge of a government investigation. So if the, if, if the relator files the complaint and it's still under seal and the government's done nothing to indicate to you that there's an investigation yet, I would argue very well to the government that, um, uh, you know, this is not, this is a voluntary disclosure because we had no knowledge. So it's going to come down to what, you, if you have even a hint that there was an investigation, you're probably not going to be eligible. Okay, test claims to see if a company will pay a claim, uh, claw back, consider a false claim. Well, you know, that's an interesting scenario. So I think it depends on what's known by both sides of the test claim. Um, if, you know, I always say, if you're going to do something, you're not sure about whether or not something can be paid, the first thing is to ask them the question. Hey, we're thinking about filing the following claim. Send it to their person. Say, how would you treat this, rather than actually file it. Second is have a discussion with them about the appropriateness. And third is to document those discussions and records. If the company to be filed is is healthcare is the government, I would not ever recommend filing kind of test claims to see if the government will pay it. I think that that enters a lot of risk. Um, without really documenting it uh, and, and doing a little bit more um, validation to make sure you've done some diligence to make sure it's appropriate. Papering the file, usually through a healthcare consultant or billing expert, um, or just talking to a Medicare contractor directly and asking them. Let's see, double billing, duplications of benefits unknowingly would self-disclosure suffice? You know, honestly, in most cases, I don't even think a self-disclosure is necessary like that. If it was not knowing, if it's not knowingly done, if there's no evidence that it would be a violation of the False Claims Act, typically a, a repayment is going to be sufficient, a voluntary repayment to the contractor with a letter saying, look, we discovered this, we're paying it back. Um, it's You really need a voluntary disclosure protocol when the evidence suggests it was violative of the False Claims Act, not simply a mistake. And that's often a, a very, very case-specific, case-by-case discussion to have, so it's difficult to answer uh, uh, blank, in a blanket way. Anything else? Well, it's been a real pleasure presenting this. Uh, if, you know, I'm happy to, um, if, please, if you have follow-up questions or need some information, take my information, email me, and um, I hope all of you avoid, <laughs> despite putting me out of work, I hope all of you avoid False Claims Act investigations uh, for, for your, for your facilities and providers. Thank you very much. Have a great day.